I want to tell you, it feels so good to be back up here after three weeks of not preaching. Uh, uh, for those of you who are our visitors this morning, I know there are many of you. I, uh, my father passed away a few weeks ago, and I, I missed that Sunday, and then I had surgery and missed two more. So this is actually my first Sunday back in a while, and I love preaching, so this feels good to be back to do, doing the thing I love. Several months ago, I was flipping through the channels. I do that occasionally because with Cindy not here most of the week, I'm quite often just looking for something to occupy my attention for a little while, and I, I, I stumbled across a war movie that I actually hadn't seen before. This was a movie about a, an army sergeant named Alvin York, and you may have seen the movie, you may know a lot about Sergeant York. I hadn't seen it before, and, and I knew a little bit about him. I knew he had won the Congressional Medal of Honor. I, I knew that, that there were just a lot of things that York had that were, were pretty special about him. And so I stopped and I, I started watching this movie, and I happened to catch it at the very beginning. And as I watched, I was thinking, now is this true? Or is this one of those Hollywood things that is based on a true story that Hollywood does a lot of creative editing with? I didn't know a lot about him, so I, I really didn't know the answer to the question. But as I've, I've researched him in the time since then and in preparation for this sermon, and it hasn't been a lot of research, but I found out that unlike many of those based on a true story movies that we see today, this one was pretty accurate. As the movie began, York was a hard-drinking, hard-working, hard-fighting, hard-playing guy. And he was also a crack shot. And then and his reputation in the community wasn't real good because of all the drinking and fighting that he did. But he attended church every Sunday with his mother. And one day, something happened in the course of this worship service that grabbed a hold of him, and Alvin York gave his life to Jesus Christ. And when he was in, he was all in. And he started praying regularly, he started studying his Bible, and he got to where he knew the Bible really well. And as World War I was on the horizon for the United States, Alvin York was forced to register for the draft. He didn't want to. It wasn't that he was brave. This was a guy who really wasn't brave very much. But he didn't want to because in his study of the Bible, he had learned that he learned the Ten Commandments really well. And that one that says, Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, that was real high on his list because he figured that if God put ten separate ones, that those were real high on God's list. And so he didn't want to kill another human being. Well, his pastor convinced him he really didn't have a choice but to register for the draft. And he finally did. And then he was drafted. And he didn't want to go. Well, once again, they convinced him that he didn't have a lot of choice. He had to go. But he still said the whole time that he wasn't going to kill him. Uh, once he was in basic training, it didn't take the Army very long to figure out that they had a really good shot on this young recruit. And so they started to, to talk to him. And his company commander, Captain Edwin Danforth, and his battalion commander, Major Gonzalo Burke, Buxton, Major Gonzalo Buxton, himself a very devout Christian, started to talk to him and told him about, about scripture verses that showed that God wasn't really completely against war, and therefore it wouldn't be a bad thing. And finally, they, they sent him home on a 10-day furlough, and they said, over this 10 days, we want you to pray about it, to study your Bible, to see what it is that, that you really believe in. If you come back and you still say that you can't kill anyone, 
we'll sign off on, on you being a conscientious objector. Now that doesn't, in World War I, that didn't get you out of military service. It just got you to a place where you'd have to carry a gun. Uh, a non-combatant position. Uh, a, a movie that is currently in theaters that I haven't seen yet, but I'm told is about a, a medic who was a conscientious objector during World War II. And he could serve as a medic in spite of being a conscientious objector because he wasn't carrying a gun. Well, such was, would have been the case for Alvin York, except when he came back from that furlough, York said that God had revealed to him that it was going to be okay and that he was supposed to fight. So York did. And as I said before, when he was in, he was all in. When time passed along and the Battle of the Argonne Forest came around, Alvin York, now a corporal, recently promoted, along with uh, a couple of other corporals and nine privates, were led by the platoon sergeant Bernard Early. And they had captured a number of soldiers and were ordered to, to infiltrate a machine gun, German machine gun nest that was just really tearing up the Allied forces as they were trying to advance. And so this group was sent, and they, they got to the headquarters and they found a group of soldiers there that were getting ready for a counterattack against U.S. forces, and they captured all of them, but while they were working with them, the machine guns started firing, and several of them, including all of the non-commissioned officers except York, were killed. And there were seven privates, there were 13 privates, I'm sorry, I said nine, but there were 13. Except York and seven privates. York left the prisoners under the guard of the other seven, of those seven privates, and himself moved forward. And as he moved forward, six Germans with fixed bayonets charged him. His rifle was out of ammunition, but he pulled his pistol, and he killed all six. And then he hollered out for the Germans to surrender because he didn't want to kill any more people than he had to. Well, a German officer came after him and emptied his, as, as the York was trying to stay away from the machine gun fire, emptied his gun at York and missed, and then surrendered because he thought his mounting losses. In all, York and his men captured and brought back to Allied lines, 132 German officers and men. He almost single-handedly captured more than half of them. For his trouble, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor, the Senior Service Cross, an immediate broad increase in rank to sergeant, and was also decorated by French forces and forces from Montenegro. Overwhelming odds that York and his men faced. And you know it's not the first time that someone went out and faced overwhelming odds. Our lesson this morning is just such a story. Except, except that this is a story of a boy and a man. It wasn't the first time even then that an army had faced overwhelming odds. But this was one young boy, David, whose father had sent him to check on his brothers that were, were fighting the war. And when he got to the lines and found his brothers, they made fun of him. But he heard the voice of this Philistine across the lines ridiculing the army of Israel who was shaking in their boots. If I would have started this lesson a few verses earlier, we would know that, that Goliath, by these verses, was over nine feet tall. His helmet alone, of all of his armor, weighed more than 15 pounds. Folks, can you imagine trying to carry 15 pounds on your head? That's a tough thing to do. Have some strong neck muscles to carry that around for very long. And Goliath kept calling out, Send me your champion. 
and none of the Israelites wanted to go. Now think about this too. Imagine yourself going out to fight a battle with a soldier that's nine feet tall. I'm five feet. This guy is a good three feet taller than I am, if not more. It would kind of be like one of our tiger cubs here, a hunter, going up against Shaquille O'Neal. Think about that for a minute. David, he's probably 12, 13 years old, something like that, fighting a full-grown man is probably the biggest man he's ever seen in his life. And that doesn't may not sound like such a big deal in a war setting because we think about war, I mean, that big, that big guy like that, he's an awful big target. But we're thinking about war in our sense and not war in the sense that David was having to fight. I mean, if Hunter was to try to come up and fight me, he'd be at a pretty bad disadvantage just based on physical size. Not to say that Hunter's a, a weakling or any of that. He's just a little guy. And David was much in the same boat. David um, knew. Okay, I'm not sure sometimes whether it was age and naivete, if it was, was stupidity on his part or something else. And really, I know that it was something else because David knew the power of God was with him. And so he stepped forward. And Saul says, you can't do that. They said, oh, yeah, I can. And so then Saul lets him out of his arm. Now, now again, I, I, I want you to think about one of these tiger cubs over here, or Hunter, dressed out in a full adult suit of armor. David couldn't move in it. Of course he couldn't move in it. It was grown man clothes. You remember the movie back several years ago, Big, and Tom Hanks' character? is walking down the street in a suit and all of a sudden he goes back to being a kid and so he's walking on the bottom of the pants legs and the coat sleeves are hanging off of him and I mean, it was like that except instead of cloth for a suit it was suit made out of metal he had a tough thing to do David said I can't do this and so David takes the armor off Gives Saul back his weaponry. He goes to the screen bed and he picks up five rocks. And he has a slingshot. And he steps out to do that. He had faith in God like no one probably any of us has ever seen before. Because David knew that God was with him and that God would see him through in spite of what looked to be overwhelming us. He stepped out. He swung a rock. It hit the giant. And the giant went down. And Israel swung the other day. Valor in the face of overwhelming us. Again and again throughout history, men and women have stepped forward, some in faith, some on their own, to face overwhelming odds. One doesn't have to study history for long to find multiple examples of these kinds of stories. There are heroes who step out in faith. And I want to say to you, I'm not one of them. I'm a veteran. I'm a proud Navy veteran. You go on my Facebook page and you look down it, you'll see all kinds of Navy stuff that's out there because I enjoyed my time in the Navy. I'm, I'm glad I didn't try to make a career out of it, but I enjoyed the Navy. And I don't regret it all, but I happened to serve during a very tense time in our national history, but it was also peace time. I served during the Cold War. After Vietnam was over, before Kosovo or, or any of those other battles happened, I was in that time in between. And I'd like to think that if I was faced with that kind of situation in my life, 
that I'd step up like Sergeant York did, or I'd step up like David did. But the truth is, I don't know and I'll never know because I've never been touched with that. Bullets never flew by my head. I am not a hero. But I also think about people like my dad. My dad also was a proud Navy vet. My dad was an engineer on the USS Polo Dam. It was a fleet oil. His whole job was to be out and refuel the fleet. He was in here in Korea. There is not a more vulnerable time for a Navy ship, and particularly its oilers, than during underway replenishment. Taking on fuel as they, they go down a straight line in the ocean. They can't turn, they'll run into each other. And they're pumping fuel, sometimes as many as seven ships wide, from one ship to the other. Flammable fuel. And if somebody were to come and attack during that point in time, it could be disastrous. <clears throat> and being an engineer, I was thinking when I worked up on the bridge, and while it had it would have its own set of dangers in time of war, at least I might be able to get out. But on a tanker, working down in the, the lowest hole of the ship. His ship would have been attacked, my dad wouldn't have had much of a chance. I see him as a hero. <coughs> Our own Harold Brooks. Harold and I did the same job in the Navy. He's the only person I've ever known other than the guys I worked with that did the same job that I did. I teased him one day that I outranked him. Because I was a second class petty officer when he got out. When I got out, he was a third class. And so he didn't laugh. He thought that was funny. But Harold's a hero. Harold, during World War II, steamed around the Pacific on a tin can. For you not Navy folks, a tin can is a destroyer. It was a tough battle. And I consider every World War II vet we have to be a hero. Because without them and the sacrifices they made, we might all be speaking German right now, and life might not be as fun in this country as it is. I mean, we think we got problems now. Think about what it would have been without the World War II then. <coughs> Harold Brooks and that whole generation of heroes. I admire those. I could go on and on with stories of, of people in this country who served in our military, who are special people, who've done heroic things. But I would submit to you that all of we who served, because at least there was a willingness. I don't say it because I'm one of them, but I say it because I believe it to be true. All of us were willing to put our lives on the line for our country. Or we wouldn't have joined the trouble. And all of them are special people. You see, they stood in the breach, many of them. And many of them didn't come home. such as the nature of war. But I would submit to you that every one of them, maybe not every one, but most every one of them knew who God was and knew God was with them. I've heard this morning a saying I've heard many times before that there are no atheists in foxholes. I'd say there aren't any atheists on ships either when they're getting shot at. Most of these folks knew what it meant. Fun. And because they saw people around them die, they had some kind of idea of what that meant as well. And it doesn't mean that God wasn't there. God doesn't create war people do. 
And God was very present there and very present in their lives. And in war, people die. And for many of our veterans, such was what happened. Today, we veterans and non-veterans alike are facing another battle. But this time, the weapons aren't guns or missiles. But I believe it's the weapon that is even more dangerous. Today, following possibly the most contentious election in U.S. history, we find ourselves in the middle of a war of words. Sometimes a war that's involving violence that is unnecessary and it shouldn't happen. Many of us, me included, find ourselves standing in a place where we need to stand before God and repent for some of the things that we've said about our fellow citizens. Our fellow citizens who have different views from our own. As I look at the deep wounds and divisions within our society, I can't help but think that we're facing some pretty long odds. But still, as people of faith, I believe God is calling on us to stand in the breach today. I believe that we are to hold on to the light and the love of God to call into question those that we see and to hear who are acting in ways that fall short of the loving God that calls us to action and the love that God would have for all of his children. It's time for us to go back to Jesus' words and the Beatitudes. His words in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, Blessed are those who make peace because they will be called children. If we want to be called, we want to call ourselves children of God, you and I need to be peacemakers. I do believe our veterans served in order to see this, or excuse me, I do not believe that our veterans served in order to see this nation destruct from the inside out through the hateful language that we're hearing in our eyes. I know I can't speak for all veterans. In fact, I can only speak for one, me. But today, I choose to honor my fellow veterans. Today, I choose to honor those with whom I may disagree. Today, I choose to honor God by remembering and striving to live out the greatest commandment for love. Merriam-Webster's dictionary defined, or actually website, defines valor as strength of mind or spirit that enables a person to encounter danger with firmness. The danger we face today doesn't come from weapons of destruction, but make no mistake, it's very real. It is a very real danger because words matter, but so do actions. And our actions need to, to move beyond the words that we hear, the words of love that God calls us to be and calls us to share. I am a veteran. I'm a proud veteran. But I am also a Christian. And that is even more important. It is more important today for my country than my status as a veteran has ever been. Or really, as much as it ever will be. It is so because today my country needs me to live out and act out my faith. I no longer care about the results of this election. I don't care about anyone's political persuasion. What I care about is claiming this community for the love of God and Jesus. Sergeant York, a man of faith, knew God was with him and he stood tall in the faith. David, a boy of faith, knew God was with him and he stood firm in his faith. People like my dad, Carol Brooks, and hundreds of thousands more, probably millions more, have stood in the faith and 
difficult times. And today is time for me to stand in the faith. And I believe it's time for you to stand tall as well, to stand in the breach, to stand for the love of God that he has for his children. Bethany, our society needs us. Our society stands in me. You have answered the need before, and I'm calling you to join me to step into the breach once again, but this time with a different mission in mind. To read, excuse me, to lead the way in being the kind of people God calls us to be, to stand up for the love of God in Jesus Christ. There is more than enough hate. Like it or not, it exists all around us. It exists in the world, and it exists in our country on both sides of this past election. I fear that few, if any of us, have our hands completely clean. You know, not too many years ago, there were, were four letters that were the kind of the rage of the Christian community, WWJD. And, and they got to be so popular, even non-Christians started wearing them. They might not have known what it stood for. And just in case if you don't know or don't remember, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? The idea being in every situation that we would ask ourselves what Jesus would do. And then to live out the answer. Whether you are a veteran or not today, I call on you to join me. Ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do in the various situations that you find yourself in? Listen to the answer. And then live the answer. I want to leave you with one last verse of scripture this morning. Since election night, it's been sitting in my mind over and over again, and I'm, I'm kind of living with it right now. 1 Peter 4 8 says, Love one another deeply, for love covers a multitude of sins. Friends, there's a lot of sin out there in the world, there's a lot of sin around us, and that world needs some love. Some love from people who claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ to cover all of that sin. This day, I choose love. Please join me in the name of the Father.